Yes, uh, uh, Christiana and I want to present a critical review of um, studies of archaeometallurgy, especially in the early period, from the late Neolithic through to the uh, late Bronze Age in the Central Med. Um, starting, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's in similar fashion as what um, we did with the introduction. Uh, it's uh, um, a review of the achievements and breakthroughs that occurred in the last 25 years in this subject. Uh, then offering a glimpse of ongoing research um, in, in the area and try and gaze into the crystal ball to see what the future may hold for this important field of, of studies. And true to, to our expertise, the paper will have a strong focus on Italy and the Southern Alps, as opposed to you know, the whole of the Central Med, uh, and will concentrate on the period from the late Neolithic uh, to the late Bronze Age. Uh, a lot of impo important research is not going to, the, to be mentioned in the paper due to time constraints, and uh, we wish to apologize to the many colleagues uh, whose work will go uh, sadly unacknowledged here. Right, okay. We want to start again a review looking at what we stood 25 years ago, uh, AD 1994. Not, uh, I have to say, for archaeometallurgy, not a very good place to be uh, for most of us. And with notable exceptions in places like uh, uh, Sardinia, Corsica, and the Eastern Alps, uh, the study of early metallurgy um, in this area, in the Central Med, suffered from a period of neglect uh, um, due to the absence of sort of a joined up archaeological and scientific uh, agenda at the time. Um, and so instead of listing all the things we didn't, didn't know about and we do know, or the things that we thought we knew and it turned out that uh, were wrong uh, or, or, or certainly perfectible, I want to um, just uh, give a sense of what we stood uh, uh, with this scary picture of the one metallurgical topic that was debated the most back uh, in the mid-1990s, which is the chronology of early metal objects. That's a scary picture. Um, don't run away, please. Uh, uh, actually, <laughs> this image, this actually was published in 2001, a bit later, but we, if back in the early 2000s, that was still, if you like, the framework, that was still the agenda, um, uh, for most people at least, not, not perhaps everybody. Um, um, uh, and this is uh, an image of the chronology, of, uh, or type chronology, if you like, of um, Chalcolithic and early Bronze Age uh, metal tools from the north, uh, which is higher up, and uh, central Italy as well, which are two main areas uh, for metallurgical innovation and production in this period. Uh, and uh, published in 2001, it was grounded in a proposal that dates back three, 30 sorry, years earlier, uh, back to 1971, and using a method, chronotypology, that had remained fundamentally unchanged since the early 20th century. Compare the two, please. Um, obviously, the, the, this is a different kind of chart, but it is under this, but this kind of type of chronological schemes for pottery, for metals uh, especially. Um, um, so, so the sequence, uh, the Italian one, uh, as well as Gordon Childs, of course, uh, is not tied to absolute chronology, as radiocarbon uh, was largely ignored at the time. Um, still, most people believed that the first metallurgical horizon, this lever you see here, uh, was late, uh, uh, mid-late 3rd millennium BC, and all the rest was early Bronze Age, end of the 3rd, beginning of the 2nd millennium BC. As we will see in a moment, this was all dramatically wrong. And we've learned this in the last 25 years, of course. Uh, um, so in the last 25 years, uh, <clears throat> we, we, we really had a quantum uh, leap in the study of early metallurgy all over the region. And this was made possible by new research collaborations between archaeologists and material scientists, as well as new cross-border collaborations, uh, which led to fresh questions and a renewal, renewal of the research agenda overall. <clears throat> Major strides were made in four areas I want to talk about briefly uh, now. The chronology, of course, of early metal working and metal using, early copper mining, uh, smelting and metal working technology, and uh, metal procurement and exchange. Uh, so let's start with the thorny chronology issue to get a sense of how things have changed of late. Um, uh, the application of radiocarbon to metalwork rich burial sites uh, has demonstrated that copper production did not kick off in the third millennium BC, as most people 
um, uh, believed at the time, uh, not all of them, I'm actually pleased to see some of the uh, uh, naysayers in the room here, but um, uh, in the late 5th millennium BC, late Neolithic or final Neolithic, um, and this was followed by a major surge in metalwork production in the mid 4th millennium BC, which is really captured by a deluge of now. This is just a few, it was published in 2010, but uh, we have many, many more radiocarbon dates now. There's a deluge of, of radiocarbon dates calibrating uh, fines in this range, right in the middle of the 4th millennium BC. That there was a surge in metal production and metal use at this time, the early Copper Age. Uh, and, and by the end of the 4th millennium, metal working and metal using was well underway in most of the region, with the exception of Sicily and Malta, perhaps because these islands lie some distance away from the copper sources. Uh, and just to get a sense of where the copper sources are, this is a very approximate map uh, of uh, you know, the location and, and kind of relative size. I mean, it's, it's exaggerated, of course. Uh, of copper sources, we have uh, two important regions in the southeast and Alps, Trentino, Tradige, and then Tuscany, and then a scatter of sources in the Alps, Northern Apennines, uh, Corsica, Sardinia, of course, and a few minor sources in Calabria, and one in northeastern Sicily. We don't know uh, uh, whether these were exploited um, at, at the time. But it's interesting to see how early metallurgical cultures dating to the Copper Age overlap with these uh, um, copper sources. And, and normally, as we have also in the rest of Europe, there's quite a good overlap of these cultures, or funerary traditions in some cases, uh, overlap uh, uh, or developed, if you like, quite close to the old sources, uh, with one notable exception, which is, of course, Gallo in Campania, the Gallo culture, which is quite metal rich, is, uh, it lies quite, quite uh, you know, it's quite far from uh, metal sources. Um, we don't know yet where the copper used by these guys came from, perhaps Calabria, but there's no work uh, uh, being done, and this is actually one of the, the, the questions, if you like, for the near future. Uh, I just want to go through um, uh, important discoveries made in the last 25 years in terms of mining sites. This is all stuff you know very well, uh, just mentioning uh, some of the most important sites that were discovered, published in the last two decades. Of course, Libiola and Monte Loreto in Liguria, but also saint Véron in the French Alps, uh, which is a, a mid late third millennium BC uh, mining and also smelting site, and Grotta de la Monaca in Calabria. And these sites overall demonstrate the antiquity and scale of copper procurement in Central Med. In Central Med, bear in mind that survival of these uh, mining sites is very, very much hit and miss. You know, very often what survives is the unimportant, the minor sites, because the important sites were actually all the prehistoric activity was destroyed by later open cast or even just historical mine, mining. Um, as far as copper uh, smelting uh, goes, considerable research was carried out in the southeastern Alps uh, and also in Tuscany. In the Alps, research by Gilberto Artioli and his team, and I'm just uh, uh, showing some of the publications that came out uh, uh, from Padua, from the Padua team in the last 10-15 uh, years. Uh, but this is important piece of research that's clarified that uh, hard to smelt uh, copper, iron copper sulfides, such as chalcopyrite, for example, were efficiently smelted in the Alps from the 3rd millennium BC. And by the late 2nd millennium, at the late Bronze Age, the technology was so advanced that copper was mass produced uh, in complex operations involving extensive manpower, massive fuel consumption, and a carefully controlled operational sequence. Um, Things are less clear for Tuscany. We don't have not nearly that amount of research done on the early Tuscan sites, but I just want to show a book, uh, which uh, an important book that perhaps not all of you know that came out uh, fairly uh, recently about uh, um, San Carlo, a, a smelting uh, site, fourth millennium smelting site in the Tuscan Collina Metallifera, which has revealed a surprisingly advanced reduction technology involving the smelting of several old types at this domestic site. And the technology is so much more advanced than anything uh, practiced in Europe at the time that we need further research to understand the broader implication of this discovery. This is just the beginning of uh, future work that must be done on these and other Tuscan sites dating to the fourth millennium. And the last two decades also saw the application of lead isotope analysis for the first time 
which is a metal provenancing technique, to regions other than Sardinia, and to problems other than oxide ingots, which had generated a lot of attention earlier on. So again, Artioli and his team researched Chalcolithic and Early Bronze Age uh, uh, metals from northeast Italy, and they argued that, with few exceptions, most notable perhaps being the Iceman's axe, that uh, seems, to, I mean, copper uh, used to make this axe uh, uh, seems to come from Tuscany, not the local uh, sources. But overall, I mean, by and large, these objects were made of copper coming from Trentino Alto Adige. And uh, so these highlight exchange networks of regional scope. Interestingly, a different method, not necessarily provenancing, I'm not going into that, but if you're familiar, this is the so called Oxford system or Oxford method which char charts uh, changes in alloy composition over time for assemblages of metals, um, was also applied to this region, to the Alps. And uh, so it's a slightly different method that looks at similar problems, although the overlap is not complete. They look, uh, it also looks into recycling of metals over time. Uh, and um, its application revealed that in the Copper Age, most metal objects were procured, exchanged, and consumed locally in self-contained small circulation uh, spheres. But, but, but the variation in alloy composition decreased in the early Bronze Age, pointing to exchange and admixture within broader circuits in the Western, and sorry, this is Eastern, of course, <laughs> and Western Alps, uh, respectively. And tin bronze also first emerged in this period, with tin moving independently from the copper, but interestingly, following the same East-West split. Remarkably, the split does not follow the Alpine watershed, but cuts it uh, uh, in half from the Swiss plateau to the Po Valley, cutting across physical, this is the tin line, uh, uh, with more tin on this side and less tin, or later also, tin appearing later on the other side of the tin line. Uh, it cuts across phys physical geography and a navigable river system, of course, with the Po Valley. So culture, not nature, dictated metal exchange in the prehistoric Alps, as well as northern Italy. So we're now presenting, uh, briefly, a very personal summary of what's boiling in the pot right now, and with the handy excuse that you can only present unpublished research you know of, we uh, take this opportunity to blow our own trumpets to some extent. Uh, um, so research hot of the press, things happening right now, but not quite yet uh, published, not quite yet in the public domain. Uh, we start with chronology, which is all, all of uh, Christiana's work. Uh, 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 he researched this stuff in a recently concluded Marie Curie Fellowship at Newcastle. Um, and he approached the problem of chronology, chronology of these artifacts, which is highly uh, debated, uh, from a new angle, combining a review of radiocarbon dates from metal rich sites, a critical reclassification of early metal work enhanced by uh, wear analysis, um, looking at manufacturing technology and transformations of these objects over time and the reassessment of typological links with Central and Eastern Europe. The results, which we are um, in the process of publishing right now, uh, have defied expectations, I have to say. Uh, the research brought down the evidence into a much more detailed sequence than previously available. Previously, we had, if you like, a three-period uh, um, um, separation of the Copper Age, early, middle, and late Copper Age, but very often, uh, metals were generically dated to the Copper Age, and some uh, was debated if it was, if it was Copper Age or actually Early Bronze Age, so it was a bit of a mess. Now we have a clear classification scheme, a quite detailed one with periods lasting just a few centuries. This is a major breakthrough for understanding the evolution of metal technology in, in the whole of Italy, not just the north or the center. Uh, um, 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 so, so, so Christiana's charted regional trends as well as chronological trends in the evolution of metal technology which were hidden by the coarse or partly incorrect chronology of old. And the most important, the one I want to flag up here, is that after a common start in late Neolithic, Horizon 1, uh, right at the top, it's late Neolithic, in North and Central Italy, there's a common start at that period, uh, the two regions, North and Central Italy, went their own, diver their own ways, diverging trajectories in the fourth millennium with metal production booming in the center in the mid fourth millennium early copper age but actually disappearing almost in the north and ongoing research is trying to clarify if this is a visibility issue so of course these metals were by and large used for burial so any change in burial practices just hides 
all the metals, so that's a possibility, but all a real thing, you know, if this is actually a hiatus, which of course we have north of the Alps in this period, was actually happening in, uh, in the southern Alps at the same time. That's a distinct possibility right now. Right, moving on. Another Marie Curie project I'm supervising right now in Newcastle looks at the function of early U European daggers by experimental archaeology and microanalysis. And this is one of the first projects cutting across this quite sharp disciplinary divide separating flint and metal tools, at least in useful analysis. And research fellow Isabella Caricola is now analyzing uh, flint and metal daggers in a comparative fashion, including, it's, it's a broader project than just Italy, but it does include uh, daggers from Italy, both flint and metal. And finally, I want to present results of a recent project examining the provenance and circulation of 20 um, copper age axis daggers and halberds from central Italy, which combines object chemistry and lead isotope analysis. And uh, this is, um, should be out in early next year. And the research showed that while about, the sample is small, just uh, 20 objects, uh, and about 15 of, of these, as perhaps was expected, were made from copper, likely originating from Tuscany. Uh, Tuscany is very rich in copper, so this is not a surprise. The surprise really is that other objects, about four, come from further afield, from, from the Western Alps, uh, and one might actually uh, uh, come from France, from the Massif Central region. So um, the data, this is quite surprising and clearly warrants further research with broader samples. But, but, but the, the, the data also suggests that copper exchange at this time followed three largely independent networks. The first is the Tyrrhenian Sea and the Western Alps, perhaps stretching into France, um, with a question mark at this stage. The second in the southeastern Alps and adjacent regions, mainly northeast north Italy. And the third in the northeastern Alps, uh, stretching into the Balkans. Uh, and perhaps because of their location, the prehistoric communities of, uh, are located in modern, modern day Switzerland could tap into the three networks at the same time, reaching out on occasion as far as France, Tuscany and Serb Serbia, which actually demonstrate that the Swiss got it right uh, since the third millennium BC. Um, we will now try and, and gaze into the crystal ball, and this is wrapping up my presentation now, uh, and uh, see what, how future research is shaping, what needs to be done most urgently to fill knowledge gaps in this region. And it's a very brief overview of what I think are the two or three most important areas we need to to research and develop in the next five to ten years, maybe. Um, the first set of questions concern early metal technology and artifacts. You'll be pleased that chronology is not here. I think it's very much uh, a job done as far as me and Christiana are concerned. Anyone want to join in there, you're welcome. But uh, we've done our bit for, for King and Country. Um, the first set of questions concern early metal technology and artifacts, and especially smelting and metalwork technology south of the Alps, we, we know very little about still, and um, we, we, we have a good understanding of how copper was extracted in the Alps, uh, but this surprising discovery of very advanced smelting technology in 4th millennium Tuscany has generated urgent questions about the timing and about the nature of this technological leap forward. Uh, and, and one of the pressing questions for me is this discovery, or, or if you like, improvement, massive improvements in extraction technology, has any bearing of the development of um, early metal working in the rest of Europe. If, if you like, for, in other words, if they discovered a good way of smelt um, uh, copper sulfides and passed on this innovation to other regions, or perhaps we could have independent discoveries elsewhere. So these are the big questions for me. Um, second set of questions regards metal procurement and exchange. Um, again, most of the research focusing on the Alps Tuscany and Sardinia up to this uh, uh, time, it's now time to complete the isotopic map of Italy. So, so we know nothing about south of this area. I mean, admittedly, there isn't much in terms of copper sources, but there are some in Calabria, in Sicily, some in Lazio. They haven't been um, uh, fingerprinted yet. So we need to do more to complete the isotopic map of Italy. After all, some of these minor sources could have been really important in prehistory. So we need to, um, to, to, to research that. Uh, and equipped with the new map, we should make an effort to trace exchange networks across time and geography, using not just lead isotope analysis, which is an important method but comes with its own limits, but also the conceptually different Oxford system, 
uh, the two complement and validate each other. And perhaps the most important challenge, however, lies in the need to re-socialize metallurgy using science and archaeology to address social questions, you know, the big social questions like lying at the heart of prehistoric research. For example, what was the social context uh, of early metal making and using? And what was the role of metalwork in the transformation of prehistoric society? And perhaps can we finally move away from catch-all explanations involving prestige goods and social elites, which may work well for the Bronze Age, not, I would argue, not so well perhaps for late, the late Neolithic and Copper Age, and propose, especially for these earlier periods, alternative models to make sense of early metalworking. And here we maintain lies of one of the greatest challenges for the next 25 years. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.